Software Engineering Radio Episode 62, Scala with Martin Odersky. Welcome listeners to this new episode of Software Engineering Radio. Um, in this episode, we're going to talk about the Scala programming language with its creator, Martin Odersky. This is the first episode of SE Radio that's co-produced with ACM Uppsala. Let me give you the background. Uppsala is a conference, as you might know, that happens each year in October in the US or in Canada. This year it's in Montreal, Canada. And the Uppsala folks decided that they wanted to have a podcast to advertise the Uppsala program. To do that podcast, they approached uh, Software Engineering Radio as well as Dim Sum Thinking, Daniel Steinberg, to help. And uh, we agreed. What we're going to do is that we're going to interview a couple of people that are relevant to the Uppsala program because they give tutorials, keynotes, or run workshops. And um, the interviews are going to be posted on SE Radio as well as on the Uppsala website, um, the Uppsala website version is going to be an edited version that features less content. It's going to be 20 to 25 minutes, whereas, as you can see, this one is almost an hour. There will also be a couple of episodes on uh, oopsla.org slash podcasts that are not featured on SE Radio for various reasons. For example, because we've already talked to that person or because the topic is not really relevant for SE Radio. Um, so you should uh, go and visit uh, oopsla.org slash podcasts. Okay, so let's get started with today's content. Uh, as I said, it's going to be a discussion about the Scala language with Martin Odersky. Okay, Martin, welcome to uh, the podcast here. Um, before we discuss Scala in detail, why don't you ex explain a little bit about your personal background? Okay, so I have uh, grown up in Munich in Germany. I uh, then uh, did my PhD in the group of Niklas Wirth at ETH Zurich, uh, working on structured programming in Modular 2 and languages like that. Uh, then I've been uh, living in a lot of countries, starting uh, with uh, the US, where I worked for uh, IBM research at uh, Yorkton Heights uh, at Yale University. Then I also worked in Karlsruhe in Germany and in Australia. And since 1999, I'm here in, at EPFL in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. So from my research interests, I've sort of shifted from classical structured programming to uh, functional programming. I've been working a lot of on, on that. And uh, the last 12 years or so, my main occupation has been to transplant functional programming ideas back into mainstream languages. Which is, of course, also one of the main uh, ideas in Scala. So why don't you give us a two-minute overview over the Scala language to, to give us a, a flavor of what we're going to talk about. Okay, so uh, Scala is a language which fuses uh, functional and object-oriented programming. I think it, it's, a, it's a more tight fusion than any, what, what's achieved by any other language today. And uh, it also tries to do that mm -hmm. while staying completely interoperable with Java. Uh, for me, the end result is that it feels, programming in Scala feels more lightweight and nimble than uh, programming in Java. It's more really like programming in a scripting language like uh, Ruby or Python, say. But at the same time, uh, Scala is, uh, has a static type system. Uh, so uh, it's more, uh, you, uh, it has a type system that checks more properties for you than the scripting languages. Um, nevertheless, even though uh, Scala has static types, uh, most of these types mm -hmm. you don't need to write because they are inferred to you. Uh, so the net effect is that programming in uh, Scala achieves a, a reduction in lines of code of, let's say, between two and three compared to when you program in Java. So in the end, you program faster and I hope also more reliable. Mm -hmm. So so why did you develop Scala? I mean, um, you mentioned already the idea of fusing functional and, and more mainstream, i.e. object-oriented programming. Was that the main driver for developing the Scala language? Even before that was this uh, 
long-standing research program to essentially try to uh, transfer ideas from more researchy languages, more functional languages, back into mainstream languages. So even before Scala, I did a language called Pizza that was in 1996, which was an extension of Java with three uh, properties which are also in Scala, namely uh, uh, parametric polymorphism or generics, uh, pattern matching, and mm -hmm. uh, first-class functions. And uh, that work eventually led to uh, the work on GJ, which is Java plus generics, which eventually led to the current design of, uh, of, of Java 5. Uh, so uh, that was sort of the pre predecessor of all that. And then when I joined DPFN in 1999, I sort of uh, decided that it was time to do something completely new and uh, to have a start from a blank sheet of paper, to, so to speak. So I tried to do something starting from really uh, very pure semantic foundations to come up with something that would combine a bit the I ideas of mainstream programming, which is object-oriented, and the ideas of functional programming. So the result was uh, called functional nets, that was the theory, and the language was called funnel. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went on for, uh, I think, two years, but then we realized that it uh, uh, I mean, it was interesting as an academic exercise, but it wasn't really a very usable language, a language that was very pleasant to program in, because um, uh, the, the encodings were rather heavy. So you would need to, to be really an expert to actually write any meaningful big programs. So then I came to realize mm -hmm. that actually the approach of Java, which is way more pragmatic to really give you a number of features which work well from a software engineering standpoint, that this is actually a good idea. And I was looking for a middle way to get all the additional power of these more advanced languages into a package that would be um, interoperable, if not the same, as, as Java. So that's the end result of what Scala has, has, has become. And, and, and where does the name come from? We had a number of names, and in the end, we just picked that because it sounded nice. And it's an acronym for scalable language. Ah, okay. So is it intended as a kind of uh, successor to Java or as a way of showing the Java community how a new Java could be like? Or is that also like an intention? Well, yeah. So, so I think we do Scala because we... We like doing it, and we like programming in it, and we like help people program in it. And uh, then, of course, if other people pick it up, uh, pick some of the genes in Scala up for their for their own language, like Scala also mm -hmm. picked up genes from other languages, whether that be Java or C Sharp or or other languages. That's that's just great. I, I think that would be a very very good side effect. But Scala is not really intended primarily as a sort of prototype language just to try things out. It's really intended as a language in its own right that people actually program. In and, and use as their primary language. Mm -hmm. you, you probably know James Noble, at least he, he knows you. Of course I know him. <laughs> and, and he once said that uh, uh, Scala is the PL1 of our time. And I think what he wanted to say with that is that it's basically a collection of many, many different features from different languages. <laughs> so any comment on that? I found that quite funny, although I, I'm not sure I agree. Uh, uh, yeah, well, no, no, I don't, I don't think I agree because... Uh, uh, I think that's even a completely wrong characterization. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I think a good way to do it is, is I, I'd like to say, if, if, we, if we, well, Scala is a rich language, that's clear. Yeah. But if you compare yeah. Scala with another rich language, let's say like C Sharp, then I think they are at completely opposite ends of the spectrum. So in what way a language can be rich. So C Sharp is rich because it has many different features. It has objects and properties and events and uh, and a lot of different control structures and, and things like that. Uh, Scala has actually not a lot of features at all. It, in, in, in some sense, it has fewer features than Java, for instance. It has no mm -hmm. primitive types. It has no uh, operators burnt into the language. It has no statics. It has a, it has a lot of the things actually get dropped. What Scala has instead is uh, a, a few very powerful and fundamental ways to abstract and compose programs. And the rest is just done in the libraries. So where something like PL1 and C Sharp would be rather broad languages that combine a lot of different aspects from different things, Scala, I would say, is a rather deep language that mm -hmm. goes, uh, that really l lets you play with the fundamental ways to transform, to, to abstract and compose programs. So in that mm -hmm. sense, it's not a PL1 at all. It's rather the opposite. Okay, I just thought it was a funny comment. I had to drop yeah. it. <laughs> so you, you already said that, that one of the main 
ideas in Scala is, of course, to introduce the ideas of functional programming into the mainstream, main, mainstream languages. So since I suspect that most of our listeners will be, well, OO folks, um, why don't you introduce a little bit the core concepts of functional programming? What is it that you integrated into the OO mainstream? Okay, so, so when people talk about functional programming, uh, I think there are two different ways to talk about it. One of it is... Uh, negative and restrictive and the other is rather positive and inclusive <laughs> so the negative and restrictive way is to say you shouldn't use assignments assignments are bad uh, you want to program without any assignments without any variables that change state dur during the execution of the program having such variables is called imperative programming and functional programming people say sort of the absence of imperative programming mm -hmm. uh, so uh, i think this is fine as a goal that you say you want to minimize state because a lot of state is often state is used is overused because every time you use state you might get some hidden dependencies between components so it has to be used with care mm -hmm. but uh, it's not it's not really what we want to do so the positive thing which we subscribe to is to say well functional programming is fun is programming The, that puts an emphasis on functions. So functions or methods uh, are treated as first-class values. You can pass them around as parameters. You can put them into variables. Uh, you can have them as fields and, uh, and, and things like that. So they're first-class objects um, mm -hmm. that you can use. And um, with that, actually, you get a lot of power, um, in particular if you combine it with some of the other syntactic conveniences of functional programming. So... One of the ideas is that you should be able to nest functions inside each other. Mm -hmm. Another idea is that, that you should be able to define functions by pattern matching. So that means you can you can match on uh, values that you uh, that, that that are parameters of functions. And this matching is uh, at first glance it looks a bit like a switch in Java, mm -hmm. but it's really much more powerful because you can have not just numbers in each case, but you can have arbitrary complex expressions that contain constructors and variables. And if a pattern matches, then actually you, it, as a side effect, it also gives you names for access paths in these objects. You really, one really has to try it out to appreciate it. Uh, but in some, it gives you a very, very powerful way to uh, access complicated data structures. Mm -hmm. well, another use case for for this pattern matching stuff that came to my mind immediately when I saw it was um, to do uh, model transformations because obviously models are complex data structures and you, you want to query structures in these models in order to do something with it. Absolutely, yeah. So it's essentially, I, I believe it's a very nice complementary match to object-oriented programming because pattern matching is uh, shines whenever you need to access a complicated structured data structure from the outside. So, mm -hmm. so that means you have not the possibility to, to just insert methods into your objects as you need it for the domain. Mm -hmm. So one use case is model transformation or any sort of compiling really where you represent a program such a structure. Yeah. Another use case is uh, XML documents. So if you have an XML document, it's complicated and it's just pure data. It doesn't come with any methods attached to it. So you want to, you will want to inspect it and process it from the outside. And pattern matching really helps a lot. Mm -hmm. So far, object-oriented folks have been very much um, skeptical about pattern matching because uh, they said it breaks representation and dependence, which is a very good thing to have. That means that uh, your program shouldn't depend on the exact data type and mm -hmm. representation of your objects. Rather just on the interfaces. Rather just on the interfaces, exactly. So recently we have actually achieved a form of pattern matching that does not break representation or independence, that keeps representation independence. And we're going to have a paper about this in the up upcoming ECOOP conference. Mm -hmm. So I think this is one of the or this shows the work we are we're doing in Scala where we really try to pick these ideas and make and completely integrate them into an, into an object oriented um, a framework uh, without any any hard edges sticking out mm -hmm. Nice. So we've already started uh, discussing some of the features of Scala. The first one we talked about was case classes and pattern matching. So um, let's let's look at, at some of at some some other features in, in Scala. So another feature that's interesting is multiple multiple inheritance, compound types, traits, mixins. When I looked at it, it, it looked like kind of a redoing Java's interfaces and and inheritance mechanism to be a bit more powerful, although it's for me a little bit hard to see where this additional power comes from. So why don't you elaborate a little bit how these things uh, relate and how they work? 
Okay, so instead of classes and interfaces as uh, for Java, Scala has uh, classes and traits. Mm -hmm. And a trait is sort of a very much enriched interface. So an interface only gives you the signatures of some abstract methods. That's all it can do. Mm -hmm. A trait can also give you some implementations of the methods, or all, all the methods might be implemented, but typically only some of them are. And it even can give you states, uh, states so some fields that go with the trait. Mm -hmm. So a trait is sort of an um, implementation module, and you then can mix these traits together using mixing composition. Uh, mixing composition is essentially um, a uh, disciplined way of doing multiple inheritance without uh, some of the problems you get with respect to name collisions and uh, diamond inheritance and things like that. Right, I figured that, but I don't know or I didn't understand why traits don't have these problems. I mean, if I inherit or implement or whatever it's called, if I extend or implement two traits that have the same methods, how do I resolve these resulting conflicts in names? Okay, so there, there are two rules for that. Um, uh, the first rule says, well, if these methods are just postulated, so they're abstract in well, one trait, no problem, and, and they are implemented in the other, then no matter how you mix the implementations, also, always fill in the abstract parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is, well, if you have several concrete methods, right. then there's a concept called a linearization of the inheritance graph. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we, we will transform your inheritance graph into a linear sequence. And uh, if uh, a, an implementation comes later in the sequence, so the, the, at the beginning of the sequence will be class object, at the end of the sequence will be the class you use in the mixing composition, and all, then all the classes of you inherit will be somewhere between the uh, between in the sequence. Mm -hmm. So if if a class comes later, then that's the uh, the implementation in that class will override any implementations that come earlier. And what's important is that this is actually synchronized with the way super works. So mm -hmm. if if you call a super from a trait, then uh, the super calls, uh, call also goes to an unknown location, namely the, the, the method that comes earlier in the linearization of the class graph when the mix-in, when the trait is, is being mixed in together. So this you don't know when you write the trait. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also why traits are sometimes, uh, or why, why the idea of the principal idea of a trait has sometimes been characterized that you can have a virtual super. So you, mm -hmm. can over, you can have a virtual super class that can be overridden by, by then uh, some real classes when you, at the time the trait is mixed into, into some other class. So what this gives you is, uh, uh, the problem with classes and interfaces, uh, classes and interfaces pose some very real problems for software engin uh, engineering, in particular system evolution. Uh, so I don't know whether you've seen the, the Eclipse uh, uh, system, which is uh, an example of a very big system that yeah. uh, evolves constantly. Yeah. So they have a lot of patterns like, uh, the problem is they have a lot of interfaces in there, of course. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, the problem is you can never ever add a method to an interface yeah. in such a system yeah. because the interface already has a lot of implementations and you can never force all the implementations to add this method. Right. So what they do instead is they have for each interface, they have interface version 1, interface version 2, interface version 3, which are different class names and which inherit from previous versions. Yeah. But they want to add a method. And then on the client code, they have to say, well, if this value is a version of interface 3, then use this method. Otherwise, if it's an instance of interface version 2, then use this workaround and so on. You, mm -hmm. you get the idea. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, for me, uh, really a very good example of an anti-pattern, a pattern you should, you, should, you should try to avoid, but which actually in a language with just classes inter in, and interfaces, there is no way to avoid right, it. Right, you have to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it, yeah. And, and how do trades solve that? Well, with traits, you can have, uh, when you add a method to a trait, you can also give oh, right. uh, the default implementation, which contains the workaround. Right. So for clients, it's completely, yeah. it's, it's completely transparent. Yeah, okay. You also have the with clause, I think, which allows you to add traits to objects, right? To, well, no. Uh, with, with, the with, with the with clause, you mix in traits to classes, uh, but orthogonal to that is this idea of objects. So an object is uh, uh, a singleton class. So mm -hmm. it's a class where which uh, whose fields exist only once, uh, and you don't need to create it. It exists. Uh, well, it gets created the first time you ever access a member of the class. Yeah. 
And uh, the idea is, un, un, so as such, it's really a replacement of statics in right. Java. We don't have statics, but this you can use as a replacement for statics. But it's, it actually does more than statics because it lets you inherit also from classes and it lets you also mix in traits. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can combine with, with an object. So that means that, that you can have singleton objects that inherit behavior from, from, from classes or from traits. That reminds me a little bit of uh, Object Pascal and Delphi uh, a long time ago when there were forums and those were also like singleton objects. I That's think. right. Yeah. No. No. The idea of singleton object is uh, is has has come up time and time again in a, in a number of languages. Another mm -hmm. one is, is a beta beta language. Mm -hmm. also has. Yeah. So we talked about mainly about some of the object oriented well in inventions in Scala in the, in the past couple of minutes. So let's let's go over to some of the functional things. So um, you already said in the introduction that a functional language is characterized by the fact that functions are first-class values. So one thing that comes to mind immediately if you talk about these things is closures. Right, yeah. So, so a closure is essentially a function value, which uh, in a sense captures the definitions of all the variables around the function value when it was first created. That's why it's called a closure. But yep. in, for all intents and purposes, you can, you can use closures as an alias for function values, really. So when we say functions are first-class values, what does it mean? Well, for one, it means that, well, if you have, let's say, a number, that's a value. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things you can do with a number is you can just write it down. You can write 42, and that's mm -hmm. a number 42. You don't need to actually do uh, a definition to say uh, int uh, my number, and then you define it to be the number 42. You can use it directly. That means mm -hmm. you have a literal. Form. Literal, yeah. So for functions also, because they're first class values, you have literals. And that's what's usually called a closure syntax. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, this is closure. It, uh, you designate some of the, uh, you designate the parameters of the function, then comes an arrow, and then comes the, an expression or a block which computes the result of the function. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a natural uh, consequence of the fact that functions are first class. So it means you also want to have literals. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of having that is that it gives you a very convenient way to introduce new control structures, so mm -hmm. to abstract over control. So uh, one of the examples where this comes up is, let's say, uh, you often uh, deal with files, and uh, of course we all know that we have to close files when we're done with them, yeah. but we also know that that's something that's very easily forgotten. Yeah. So uh, uh, one way to do it is to be really very, very careful and read your program and check that every open is matched by a close that's always reachable, that's not bypassed by an exception and so on. Yeah, that gives you these ugly try finally things in Java. Right. So what closures could give you there is that you could, uh, or somebody could, uh, define in a library once and for all a thing with file do, and that takes a file or a name of a file, it opens mm. the file, if the open is successful, it will then execute a block of statements or an expression that returns a result. And then it will actually wrap this thing into the try finally. Mm -hmm. So the net effect for the client is that you only have the, this, uh, this operation with file do, which is sometimes called using right, in yeah, some languages, yeah, yeah. for instance, and, uh, and be done with it. So the nice thing is that uh, this thing is then, once you have closures, you can do it in a library. You don't need a special language form mm -hmm. for that. And, and there are many other control abstractions that, uh, that closures could give and you. Use it all the time in our compilers and, and libraries. Mm -hmm. Scala also has a very nice way of defining new keywords and, and doing some magic with uh, operators. So these two features together, closures, operators, actually it's three features, closures, operators, and, and the keyword stuff, um, that basically gives you a way of defining, yeah, well, it, you can define your own language syntax, at least it looks as if it were. But of course what happens is that Closures are built and objects are created. And uh, this is actually not really keywords. So this is just Scala's principle that uh, every operator uh, that you use is a method yeah. call. Well, it looks like uh, a keyword if you use it then, but of course it isn't. Yeah. Right. It looks like a keyword, but it's yeah, actually not a new keyword. It's just, it's just in the end, it's, it's just a method that yeah. you define on some objects. Yes. And so one thing you could do if you wanted to is uh, 
code something like uh, Ruby's uh, mm -hmm. unless. Uh, so you could have an expression unless condition. And uh, then, because the unless is between the expression and the condition, it gets interpreted as a method call on the result of the expression. And it takes the condition as, as its mm -hmm. arguments. And using uh, delayed evaluation and implicit conversions, two of the building blocks that we have to structure libraries, you can actually make this work uh, quite seamless, seamlessly. This brings us to, the, to operators. Um, you already said that in what you just explained. You can define your own operators. Right. So um, this is really um, essentially the same idea as in Smalltalk to say you don't want to have primitive types and operators. So Scala is a pure object-oriented mm -hmm. language in the sense that really every value is an object and every operation is a method call. So on the other hand, we still have uh, the we, we do have the convenient syntax, the usual syntax of Java. So you can write uh, x plus uh, y. Say uh, what it means is that uh, plus is a method on the type of x, say on the type of integers, and y is an an argument of this method. So every infix operator x plus y is treated as the method call x dot plus. Mm -hmm y in parentheses, mm -hmm. so the plus is the method call. To make this work, it means that we also don't uh, distinguish between uh, operator names like plus and uh, identifiers like unless. Mm -hmm. For Scala, the two are exactly the same, so you can have an identifier that's, that is a plus sign or that starts with a mm -hmm. plus sign. Okay, so let, let's get back to the functional stuff. Um, if you have closures, then you automatically have anonymous functions because closures, yeah, well, basically are anonymous functions, function literals. So um, you can then, of course, also define function types and function pointers, I guess. So you can uh, have maybe probably other functions that take functions as arguments because you can write function signatures. Yeah, that's that's all really part of the idea that uh, functions are first class yeah. values. So uh, you can parameterize them if a value has a type. So you need values which are function types. Uh, on the other hand, I've said Scala is a pure object oriented language. Every object, every value is an object. So it also means that every function is an object. So that mm -hmm. means that the function type has to be the type of an object. That means it has to be a class mm -hmm. or yep. a trait. As it, as it turns out, it is a parameterized trait. So if you have a function from, let's say, into string, then this is treated as the trait uh, function one. So it means a function with a single yeah. argument, with, which takes two parameters. The first is int, that's the argument type, and the second is string, that's the result mm -hmm. type. Nice. So that's also the the, the, the fundamental way of, of integrating functional with object-oriented stuff by mapping functions to objects of a specific signature, basically. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And higher-order functions are then also trivial because if you can write uh, functions as values and if you can assign them to, to variables, then it's easy to write a function that has a formal parameter that takes another function value as its argument. Correct, And that gives yes. you the, the typical stuff, you know, from, from Smalltalk and other things where you can have a map function, for example, that takes a predicate and then applies the predicate to each of the, well, select would be a better example that applies the Boolean predicate to each of the elements of a collection and then filters it. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, there's, uh, this, this, this unification of functions and objects has some very interesting consequences in its own right. So, uh, because function, the function type is a trait, it means that you can have subtypes of it. You can inherit the trait, yeah? and that means you can have more functions with richer functionality than just plain functions. So, to give you an example, one of these uh, rich, rich function types are arrays. Mm -hmm. So, an array is like a function you can select into an array, uh, but it also has other things. Uh, you can, for instance, take the length of an array or you can update an element mm -hmm. of an array. Uh, but we model that by having the, the array class actually be a subclass of the function trait. And there are several other examples. Uh, in, if you look uh, at under the covers, then uh, you will see that function, uh, these, these uh, uh, specialized function types, they underlie a lot of the, the Scala mm -hmm. libraries. You can do a lot of really interesting stuff. Yeah, that's the stuff that's a little bit non-intuitive for people who aren't used to working with functions because it's, well, it, 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 it requires a deeper understanding of functions and values and lazy evaluation, all these things. Most people in the OO world don't have that. Right, so it's a matter of... Uh, 
of um, of learning yeah. that. That's true. It's it's true that initially a lot of the stuff will will feel a bit uh, yeah. advanced. Uh, so so currying is another one of these things that is typically found in functional languages. I guess the term has nothing to do with the uh, with the taste the curry thing, but it's rather somebody who was called curry who invented it. Exactly. That was. Uh, a logician called uh, Haskell Curry, and uh, uh, if you know functional yes. languages, then you also know that there's yeah. a Haskell language. So it's the the same guy who gave his number to Haskell. Also, um, the uh, this is actually uh, this predates even functional programming. It's a it's a trick that was done in logic and lambda calculus to say we model functions with several arguments as a function that takes the first argument and then returns a function as a result which then takes the mm -hmm. second argument and so on so it was a it was a trick to keep your uh, formal foundation yeah. simple you need only functions of a single argument and it was called after after curry because he was one of the the guys who promoted it also although the roots go back further mm -hmm. than that so there was another log logician schönfinkel who i think uh, introduced that and Maybe it even goes back to... Right, Friday. now I remember. I, <laughs> I read that somewhere that the term Schönfinkeling wouldn't have been a very nice word. That's why people chose currying. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. But of course, it, it's interesting that you say that that by having a function return another function that accepts less parameters is actually a simpler solution. It's simple in a way that's non-intuitive to most people, I guess. I think there are several notions of simplicity at work yeah. here. So there's one simplicity which says I can get something off the ground with the least number mm -hmm. of rules. So this, it's simple. This curing is simple in that yeah. sense. There's another sort of simplicity which, which 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 means this thing is simple to use. Typically, the two are not the right. same thing. So uh, if you, if something simple to use uh, should be simple to use, typically you need a rather large set of rules to help yeah, you along. Yeah. And that's also why Scala has actually given up the simplistic simplistic approach and rather tries to have have a rich set mm -hmm. of rules. So. Currying exists. Uh, you can do it as a consequence that uh, functions have first-class right, yeah. values and they can return each other. But it's actually not used a lot in Scala, much less than, let's say, in purer functional languages like Haskell and ML, which use currying um, almost for all their functions, where it's the standard way to define functions. Okay. Next topic would be comprehension, sequence comprehensions. Um, when I looked at it, it some of the examples seemed rather trivial because it looked like a for loop and some of the examples I didn't get. Um, so maybe you can explain a little bit what, what, comprehension, what comprehensions are. A comprehension is, uh, again, something which can be very, very general. So it can be as simple as a for loop or it can be way more general. Uh, a comprehension, you could say, is uh, a um, Java extended for loop uh, Uh, which can also return a result. So a Java extended for loop, you step through an iterator, the successive values of yep. an iterator, and uh, each time you get a new value, you, you uh, perform a sequence of statements with this value. Uh, the next step is, well, let's assume you can do that, but each time you go through the loop, you not just do a side effect, but you also produce some item of the result. Mm. And your result would then be a sequence of of just the values that are produced mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. this. So that's the first first step. Uh, then you could go on and say, well, actually, maybe I don't want to traverse only a single iterator. Maybe I want to combine traversals of several mm -hmm. iterators or sequences. And finally, I also might might want to, uh, to filter things and uh, and um, uh, only only consider certain values. So if you take all this together, then you get a have a very fairly rich algebra in which you can express uh, a lot of amazing things. So the simplest one is the usual for loops we talked about. You can also do a lot of uh, combinatorial search programming, so of the kind that you typically find in Prolog. You can also do a lot of uh, database access programming. So these four uh, comprehensions, they essentially look like an SQL query. And actually, some of the additional libraries in, uh, that exist for Scala let you express SQL queries as these four comprehensions. So there's something very similar which has been done recently for C Sharp 3.0 with Link. That's essentially, mm -hmm. It's essentially the same thing, you might say, only that the four comprehensions in Scala, they can be used all, also for Uh, more um, for, for for different things for for more for 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 they they are a little bit more general so you can use them for other things uh, uh, um, besides database access. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, let's go back to some of the more object-oriented uh, type system features. So you have generics, right? Right. So how they're different from Java? Well, on a the basis, they're very similar. So, um, well, I co-designed the Java generic system, so right. this is not a <laughs> yeah. big surprise that they're very similar. Yeah. Um, so um, the uh, the on the surface, the biggest difference is that generics in Scala are written with brackets uh, instead of angle brackets, <laughs> but otherwise they really behave fairly similar. So, so uh, type uh, parameters can have bounds, uh, and uh, the bounds, uh, the type parameter can appear itself in the bound. So you t speak of f bounded polymorphism. So in that sense, it's exactly the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. There's one difference, uh, which is, um, uh, with respect to variances. So. After we were finished with the GJ design, the Java Fox added wildcards to the Java language. And that's where the Scala design is actually different. So the question is, what do you do if you want to express that uh, when, when you want to ge combine generics with subtyping? So for mm -hmm. instance, um, let's say you have a list of uh, numbers. and. Uh, uh, then you have a list of uh, integers, and the question is, how does a list of integers relate to a list of numbers? Right, because the, 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 the arguments are subtypes of each other. Exactly, because integer is a subtype of number. You yeah. would expect a list of integers to be a subtype of a list of numbers. Mm, which it isn't in Java. Which it isn't in Java directly, but in Java you can write something which is called a list of question mark extends number, yeah. which means a list of some unknown subtype of numbers. So that's called yeah. a wildcard. So what you can you, what you can do in Scala instead is that you can annotate the list to say, well, actually I want lists to be covariant. A list of integers should be a, a subtype of list of numbers. So uh, then we talk about declaration side variants. So it, it, that means you declare your variants, the, the, the one you want to have. Whereas uh, Java has use side variants. That means you use some some trick to ensure variance every time you use a type expression like list of question mark extends number. So that's the main difference. Um, and you can also argue endlessly which one is better. But uh, the fact <laughs> is there, there is a difference. Okay. Okay, and another related thing, I guess, uh, in with regard to specifying types and their that generality basically is type bounds. You have upper and lower type bounds. Indeed. Um, what are those? Okay, so um, the upper type bound you also have, have from Java. It just means that uh, a type parameter is restricted to be a subtype of your its upper bounds. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you can't instance it otherwise. Yeah. A lower type bound is just the analog of it. it. That means it's restricted to be a super type of the lower bound. Mm -hmm. And uh, you might say, well, I see how the upper bounds are important. Right. Is there really a use case for the lower bounds? Exactly, that was my thought. <laughs> and actually, it turns out that they are essential just to make variants work. So i give you an example. Let's stay with the lists. Uh, so, so we have decided that lists should be covariant. Uh, so list of uh, integers should be a subtype of list of number. And mm -hmm. then actually, there are some... Um, very precise rules in the type system, what you, what you can do with such lists and what you can't do. So one thing you can't do is you can't write a method in such lists where the type parameter, the list, the T in list of T, mm -hmm. appears as the type of a method parameter. You can't do that. The type system will tell you that if you do that, you, uh, you, your type system is unsound. That means uh, you can then construct an example where you would get a type error at runtime. And that's, of course, something that every yeah. self-respecting uh, type systems person tries to avoid. <laughs> that's sort of the... the <laughs> Yeah. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 worst the worst case you could, yeah. you could have. Uh, so uh, it means that um, well, one thing this is designed to prevent is it means if you have such lists, you can't let's say have an update operation that changes an element of your list. So if you if you look at it at the types, you you know that covariance and mutability they they don't go together. You can't, okay, that's uh, something I, I didn't know. Okay, so I, I can give you an example why they don't go together. Let's say list of integers is a list of uh, is a subtype of list of number. Okay, mm -hmm. I create a new list of integers. Um, I assign it into a variable whose type is list of number. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, of course the assignment is by reference as for all object oriented language. I don't actually copy yeah. the list. I just give you yeah. a, another handle to the list. Then I put in a new uh, floating point value into the head of this list. 
This I can do because it's a list of number and float is a number, yeah. so I can do this. Yeah. But I end up uh, in the original list. I end up with a list of integers whose first element is a float, and that's right. of yeah. course something I don't want. So yeah. that shows you why mutability and uh, covariance they have to be kept separate. You can't have okay. you can't have both. Uh, so the type device is that you say, well, in order to uh, prevent you from writing update, I'm going to prevent you from writing anything where the type T appears in parameter position. Ah, okay, that's of course. Okay, okay I get it. Because I was thinking about how do you, how do you, comp or, well, how do you know that something updates something? Exactly. But of course, if you, if you omit the, pram well, okay. Because there are very clever ways to hide it. So you can't just, yep. you, you can't just avoid update. You have to have something more general. So that's the thing right. that's more general. So, uh, but then what happens is that if you look at another operation called, let's, let's say, call it append, it takes yep. two lists of T and gives you back a list of T. Mm -hmm. And you say, oops, I can't do that either because the T is in parameter position. It's the thing yep. I append to a list. So uh, then the problem is that uh, the thing becomes too restrictive. So what I need to do instead is I, I have to say, well, instead of having a parameter t for append, I say, well, anything which is a super type of t is actually OK. I'll give you another, mm -hmm. another example. Let's say I have a list of int. I mm -hmm. append a list of number. Should, should this be OK? And my answer is, yes, actually, it is OK, because number is a super type of int. And what should yeah. I get back? Well, I get back a list of number. Appending a list yeah. of numbers to a list of int gives me a list of number. Yeah. Or also appending a list of float to a list of int gives me a list of number. So the whole theory and also the practice works out beautifully once I have lower bounds. But without lower bounds, everything falls apart because it becomes too restrictive. OK. Another thing that I found very, very nice when I was um, playing around with Scala is type inference, especially if you combine it with uh, generics. I mean, in Java, you really have to type quite a lot of crap, basically, to declare the, 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 the type parameters, basically, on the, in the type declaration and in the object construction in the new statement. Yeah. So that's one place where type inference actually really shines. Indeed, yeah. So I think for type inference, uh, there are various degrees in which you can do it. Uh, uh, on the other hand, sometimes you say, well, actually, I want my types because they're good documentation value, yeah. uh, sort of check documentation that's checked for yeah. consistency with the program. Yeah. So I, th I think the game of type inference is to avoid uh, annoying type annotations that most people find annoying and yeah. at the same time keep useful type annotations, type informations. Right. And uh, so that's what sort of what we have tried to do with, with Scala. It's a big engineering effort. It's not easy to come up with a good type inferencer that has these properties. Mm -hmm. There is more implicit stuff in Scala that uh, I think you should you should talk about a little bit. Some of that uh, is like, for example, coercions from from functions to methods, or from methods to functions, because what you talked about before applies to functions, and right. methods are not functions. Yeah, that's sort of another one of these uh, mechanisms that underlies it. So when I said Scala is a functional language, so every function is a value mm -hmm. and uh, it's also an object oriented language in the sense that every value is an object it means that every function is an object right, right? and indeed it is an object which has an apply method so mm -hmm. actually a function is an object which gets uh, which uh, when i apply uh, this object so i use it in front of uh, parents and some arguments and this really means that I, I, I invoke the apply method of this object right right but then you have a problem and to say well yes yeah but then the apply method that's a method so that's a function and the function is an object itself and then it never ends so you get mm -hmm. you build up an infinite <laughs> stack of apply methods so what uh, that's of course not what happens so what happens is that we say a method gets converted into a function value automatically whenever the program requires a function, be it mm -hmm. that it gets passed to some uh, argument that has, is of a function type or uh, assigned into a variable that is of function type and things like that. So that's the implicit conversion that we say we take a method and we convert it into this object with an apply uh, method uh, on demand in a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, you can also have coercions between... Uh, uh, like int and float. Oh, right. So that, that, that's stuff. another way. Yeah, right. So that's yeah. another thing yeah. where a lot of the uh, primitive conversions in Java, they're subsumed under this idea of having yeah. implicit conversions, which are also user definable. So you can actually yeah. also define new ones for, for your programs. And uh, we use that a lot to uh, do something which I like to call pimp my library that uh, we, we deal with um, 
uh, well, because uh, a Scala program is embedded into a Java environment, we use a lot of the Java types like mm -hmm. uh, like strings and uh, well primitive numbers and box numbers and strings yep. and arrays and whatever. And uh, the problem is that a lot of the Java class definitions and interfaces, uh, we really would like to have richer ones to have more functionality in them. Uh, in part, this is just because uh, the the Scala culture is more that way. In part, uh, it's because you couldn't have done it in Java because uh, Java doesn't have higher order functions, so you can't have any any methods of that kind. So uh, I, I give you an example. Let's say the class string. Uh, so strings can be considered to be sequences of characters, mm -hmm. and there is a class sequence in Scala which. Um, treats general sequences and has a lot of uh, interesting and useful functions. For instance, there's a function for each, which applies a certain block of code yeah. to each element, or a function map, which maps the sequence to some other sequence, and all these functions here. So you'd be able, you, you'd like to be able to add this to the string class as well. But of course you can't, because string is defined by a Java library, and it's a final class, so you can't, you can't fiddle with it. So what we do instead is we have a class which is called rich string, which has all this behavior. So it inherits from sequence, it adds all these methods. And uh, then there is an automatic conversion from any string to a rich string value, which gets applied whenever you declare something to be of type rich yeah. string, or more commonly when you actually call one of these methods. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's really like a bit like the extension me methods of, uh, let's say, C Sharp or Visual Basic. But it's mm -hmm. also more powerful because with this device, we can actually make string into a subclass of sequence. Whereas with extension methods, you only can add methods. Yeah. You can't let something which exists implement any new interfaces. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, the, the last of the features I think we want to talk about before we talk about a little bit more about where Scala is used and stuff is concurrency. Um, I think you've done more than just inheriting Java's threads and synchronized keyword, I guess. Uh, right. So, in fact, we don't inherit the synchronized keyword, but we can ah, remodel. Okay. It. We can model it with a uh, with a uh, with a with a one of these uh, control abstractions because you can mm -hmm. write, for instance, you can write synchronized, and then in braces a block. And, yeah. Well, uh, the right. block is it becomes just uh, just a, a a closure that you pass to the synchronized. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so. Uh, as a first approximation, we can use all Java threads, but as a, uh, we actually have built on that uh, several libraries, and we have sort of converged on one, which is called event-based actors, which is used a lot uh, in in existing Scala implementations. Uh, um, so that's actually a very good example how the power of combining functional object-oriented programming bears fruition in something completely different. So uh, what the the, these actors, uh, they are, as a first approximation, they're threads and they interact with message passing. So you can send a message to an actor and you can receive a message. But the receive actually is then a thing that uses pattern matching. So it, mm -hmm. so it says, well, essentially when you send a message to an actor, the message gets queued in a mailbox of the actor. Yep. And then you can have a receive which says at this moment in, in my execution, I'm interested in messages of this kind or that kind. And it will pick the first message queued in the mailbox that matches any of the patterns in the receive and can mm -hmm. continue from that. So this was done, uh, it's not new to Scala, this is the model that's used in the Erlang programming language, mm -hmm. which is used with uh, quite a lot of success in telecoms and other, uh, other applications that require massive concurrency. Uh, so in Scala we could do it precisely because, because we can subclass function. So these receive blocks, essentially pattern matching blocks, they're treated as something we call a partial function. So that's a function where you can actually find out whether it's defined. And you need to be able to find out whether this block is defined to do the, the process scheduling. For, for that reason, we were actually able to do the whole actor stack uh, it's purely in, in a library, so there is no special language support whatsoever for it. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the general way of uh, abstracting over partial functions was good enough. We could use it that way. and. Um, what we did then was to say, well, one of the problems with this, with the thread-based approach is that it's not very scalable. So once you go past 5,000 threads or so, your application will become yeah. seriously slow or even crash. Yeah. 
And uh, what we did there is that we actually used the closure idea to say that there, there is a version of these uh, of this receive which actually detaches not with the whole thread, so it doesn't block a thread, but it but it detaches with the closure, and that means that you only have to store a closure rather than a thread. So yeah. it, what it means is that in in the end you have the same efficiency and scalability as event-based programming, but you don't have the inversion of control. Uh, a lot of people don't like the inversion right. of control because it yeah. makes your program harder to read. Yeah. So you can still have the the usual control flow, but get the efficiency of event-based programming. Mm -hmm. Nice. So let's look about uh, look at some of the more well worldly features of languages today. What about IDE support? I guess you have an Eclipse plugin as everybody else. We have an ex ex Eclipse plugin, that's right. Okay, good. And uh, <laughs> we are uh, currently readying the second version of that, which should be, uh, which ha does some interesting stuff on highly incremental computation. So we hope it will be very, very re responsive. Um, the um, there's also a, an IntelliJ plugin, uh, which has mm -hmm. been developed by people at uh, JetBrains, the company that mm -hmm. does IntelliJ. And there is a number of um, plugins or modes for, for basically all the edit editors out there. Mm -hmm. So we hope that there will be further plugins in the future, but that's all there is right now. Yeah. So, so, but if if JetBrains, I mean, I guess the, the Eclipse plugin is something you're doing in your team. That's right. Um, but but if if there is a commercial company picking up uh, Scala and providing a, a plugin for their IntelliJ thing, then that means that Scala well it it seems to go quite well. So what about the the user community? What about the uptake of Scala? How does it feel? Is it going to be the next Java? Um, I'm I'm not sure. I think I think a lot of things would have to happen for anything to become the next Java <laughs> to become the next Java. <laughs> Uh, but actually, the uptake is quite encouraging. So uh, last month we had more than 5,000 downloads of the system, and uh, so the months mm -hmm. before also it was all, always over 2,000. Uh, so there's a lot of people who at least are try it out. Also, we know of a lot of projects, uh, mid-sized projects, some substantial mm -hmm. projects of people that uh, that have started using Scala. Um, the most uh, for instance, one of the uh, projects is a web server called Lyft, which is sort mm -hmm. of a uh, in the same space as Rails uh, for, for 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 Ruby, and where which uses uh, Scala actors uh, to with uh, with, with uh, a lot of success. So one thing that they did with Lyft uh, with uh, Lyft was uh, a, a Twitter clone uh, where. Yeah. I think previously Twitter was reputed to be rather hard to scale. So here they could scale Twitters to more than a million users cool. on a two-box two, two box, uh, Pentium system. And every user gets represented by its own actors, but mm -hmm. because of the event-based uh, compilation, that's actually not a, a, uh, a, a performance hog like it would be if it was mm -hmm. based on threads. Okay, so uh, let's briefly look at, at some of the next steps in, in Scala's development. One thing that we didn't talk about and that I've also been missing when looking at, at Scala is meta programming. I mean, that's the big new thing, at least for the mainstream. If you look at Ruby, of course, it has been there in, in CLOS and, and all these other things. So how, is there going to be some support for meta programming for in, in Scala? So there's a lot of uh, work out there, which is currently research. Uh, so I have a PhD student working on exactly that. Ah, cool. But uh, because it's uh, essentially research is open-ended so uh, we have to see what comes out of it mm -hmm. if something promising comes out of it of course we'll we, we kind of put this yep. in, the, in the distribution and release it and that'll be compile time meta programming of course that would be uh, well uh, there's, there's a spectrum that would be probably have some of compile time meta programming to it mm -hmm. but uh, the the other idea is staging that mm -hmm. means that you actually uh, have a version of the compiler at runtime compiling things at runtime mm -hmm. for you. Nice, very nice. Okay, then I want to thank you very much for being on the show and, um, well, uh, I wish you all the success you might want to have for, for your Scala language. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. 
If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.